So we'll continue on then in our service with our scripture reading, which is from Genesis chapter 45. And I'll just read for you verses 1 through 15. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, so that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years. And there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father, and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, and your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt, and of all that you have seen. Hurry, and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck, and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers, and wept upon them. After that his brothers talked with him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that this morning we can gather together to meditate on it and explore its great riches. We thank you for the help of your spirit, and do pray that you would bless the, re the meditation on your word that we have this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 speaks about the relationship between God and us, and he speaks in particular how no man can know God just on their own. We're not free to explore God and understand all that he is. We are dependent upon God to reveal himself to us. Uh, Paul says, no one knows the mind of a man, any man except the man, the spirit of the man that is within him. And so he, he makes a very common observation that I, I can't know what you are thinking at this particular moment or what anybody else might be thinking. That's only known to you in the privacy of your own hearts. Uh, in a similar way, no one knows God but the spirit of God, Paul goes on to say. And the spirit knows God fully perfectly. And the Spirit is able to take that which he knows of God and reveal it to those to whom he wills to reveal uh, that, that word from God. And so we are dependent upon any knowledge of God on that which God reveals to us, which he does so by his Spirit. The Spirit plums the very depths of the being of God. There is nothing unknown to the Spirit of God. The infinite spirit sees the infinite Father and the infinite Son and understands them fully and perfectly. There are no hidden mysteries to God for the Spirit, the Father, or the Son. 
you might compare what Jesus, or what, what Paul says to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, where he talks about how no one knows the Father except the Son, and no, and, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And so there, he speaks about his own inner, interpersonal relationship with the Father, that he knows the Father fully and perfectly. This clearly is a claim to deity on the part of Jesus. He is one who knows God fully and perfectly, and the Father knows him fully and perfectly. And so uh, he stands above us and separate from us in the sense that he is our creator, and we are creatures utterly dependent upon God for his self-revelation. And so Jesus says, no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son is willing to reveal him. And so if we wish to know the Father, it must be through the Son and the revelation that the Son gives to us. Now this revelation of the Son has been given throughout all the course of history leading up to that point as he has revealed himself in nature to a certain extent, but certainly through revelation, direct revelation. And now uh, it comes to a climax in the person of Jesus there before the disciples. Jesus is the one who reveals the Father to us and it's only through him that we can know and understand God. And so those who would suggest that it doesn't matter uh, how you worship God and, and the manner in which you worship God, if you worship God through Allah, that's one thing, and if you worship God through uh, uh, Yahweh, as uh, among the, the, the Judy, uh, those in Judaism, that's another way, and then the Hindus have their own way, and it doesn't matter which way you approach God, or some divine spirit or ground of being, if you're a mainline Protestant uh, following Paul Tillich, then that kind of description of God, the ground of being, how lovely and wonderful. Don't you just want to curl up and hug a ground of being? Uh, such a wonderful thought. Um, all these things are false in terms of what Jesus says here. We do not know the Father except the Son reveals him to us. And if we would have any knowledge of God, it must be through Jesus Christ. And uh, this is what we have uh, in, in Jesus' conversation with his disciples as he talks to, uh, talks to them just prior to his crucifixion. Philip, you recall, asked him to show us the Father, and it is enough. <laughs> and Jesus said, Have I been with you for so long that you haven't come to know me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How do you ask me then to show you the Father? You see, if we wish to know God, it is only through his voluntary self-revelation of, him, of himself. And he does that. He gives that revelation through the Son, Jesus. And then through Jesus, the Word comes by the Spirit to us through the apostles and prophets as they bring that to us in written Scripture and we'll talk about other ways in which God reveals himself to us in a moment. I say that in the context of Joseph's self-revelation here in Genesis 45, where finally Joseph discloses his identity to his brothers. And it comes with a dramatic impact on them, I'm sure. Moses, if he was a novelist, might have spent some time uh, exploring the minds and the reactions of Joseph's brothers and how they uh, grappled with the fact that standing before them was the one who they attempted first to kill and then put in a pit to leave to die and then finally decided to sell him into slavery so that they could at least profit from their brother. And so they sold him off into slavery. That was the brother that they uh, remembered Joseph long ago, this skinny little kid who was the favorite of their father Jacob, uh, who wore this uh, many-colored coat and, and uh, so incensed them that they wanted to do away with him for this. This is the one who now stood before them as Lord of all of Egypt and who could at a moment throw them into prison, at a moment take their lives. This is the one that they confronted at this moment in time. So if Moses was a novelist, he could have uh, uh, revealed to us something of the shock and dismay that uh, came across these men as they stood before their brother Joseph. But uh, Moses gives us what we need to know, 
And uh, so he uh, presents this moment in time when Joseph reveals himself, and we'll talk about that, and then the amazing uh, way, the mature way, in which Joseph speaks to his brothers with regard to their past, because their past has to be dealt with. There has to be some understanding of what, take, what has taken place, because that's going to affect everything from this point on. Uh, the past is not irrelevant. The past is not just simply glossed over. Uh, Joseph is going to deal with that, but he's going to deal with it in a gracious manner, and we'll see that as well here in just a moment. So, uh, Joseph is at a point where his emotions have gotten the better of him. Uh, we've seen him already have a couple of moments where he had to walk out from the audience with his brothers in secret and weep privately in secret, especially when his brother Benjamin stood there before him. But now we have Judah standing up for his brother Benjamin and being willing to uh, stand in Benjamin's place and uh, become a servant and a slave in Egypt. Why? Because first of his concern for Benjamin, his younger brother, and then secondly because of his concern for his elderly father and the commitments that he made for his father. He loves his father. And Joseph was moved by this, first by the willingness of Judah to step up and stand in the place of Benjamin. Judah didn't do that long ago for Joseph. Judah was the one who uh, recommended that Joseph be sold into Egypt and be trade in that way with silver. I think it was 20 pieces of silver or so. And so uh, here is a, a, a marvelous change in Judah's heart and life over the years so that now he is prepared to put himself at risk for Benjamin, Joseph's younger brother. And so this has its impact upon uh, Joseph as he watches Judah explain, not knowing that he's standing there before Joseph, watches Judah explain that he is uh, willing to take Benjamin's place. And then, too, his love for his father shines through. He cannot bear the thought of his elderly father going to his grave in sorrow because his last son of his beloved wife, Rachel, is gone from him as well. And so all of these motivating factors now come upon Joseph, and he just cannot handle it anymore. He cannot hold this uh, facade of being an Egyptian lord uh, with no connection to them, accusing them of spying and all the rest of it. He cannot hold that any further. He must drop the facade and finally reveal his identity. Um, what an amazing thing this must have been. I think you've probably seen some television programs where somebody uh, finally reveals themselves and surprises and shocks others in ways that are dramatic. I saw one video which is kind of the reverse of this where uh, a guy decided or uh, had discovered that his uh, wife and his brother were having relations and he decided to uh, catch them uh, by providing a, a birthday party for them and the present was a, a surprise which showed that he uh, knew what had taken place and it was a tremendous shock to both of them. You know, there are all kinds of weird things out there uh, but here you have Joseph now finally uh, revealing himself to his brothers. Now, Joseph first separates the family from the Egyptians. He tells all of the Egyptians to leave the room. Uh, this is notable in, the, in this sense that these Egyptians were there for his safety and well-being. You might consider that, um, that uh, they were his guard to a certain extent. And so when jo Joseph uh, asked them to leave the room, it's not only for the privacy of his relationship with his brothers and concern to keep uh, their inner political, if you will, uh, interrelational problems private. Um, Joseph is here making a big statement about the fact that now he trusts his brothers and he feels that he is safe in their presence. And so he dismisses the Egyptians and uh, then uh, meets with his uh, brothers by himself. And uh, before he's able to say anything, I think 
to them, his emotions get the better of them and he begins to weep aloud. And probably, I think the brother's sitting there watching this. Joseph still is at a distance from them. He's still the, the Egyptian lord uh, who is responsible for uh, all of Egypt. And they're just a bunch of guys from Canaan who come to visit here. Um, uh, suddenly, he's weeping in front of them by himself. And I'm sure that must have been an amazing thing for them to, to observe. And then it was so... Uh, um, violent, if you will, so loud that the Egyptians outside the room heard this. Um, Bruce Walke, in his commentary on this, notes that in Egyptian wisdom literature, it was uh, recommended that uh, Egyptians maintain a cool manner, a cool exterior, and never, as it were, give in to their emotions. And so Joseph's display of emotions and passion here uh, goes against the culture of Egypt and what they would have expected from a leader among their people. The leader was to be cool and dispassionate. That's not what Joseph was. And so here uh, we see uh, what is uh, an important commentary on, the, uh, on what God expects of us. We should be fully human and we should embrace our emotional life. And there are times when we should weep. Jesus wept at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem in uh, seeing the, the judgments that were yet to come. Uh, Jesus was a, a real human with real emotions and was free to express those emotions. Uh, so we should not be ashamed of those moments and times when uh, our emotions, as it were, get the better of us. And we shouldn't feel like we need to maintain a stiff upper lip or be stoical in the, the uh, confrontation or in, in the sufferings that we undergo in life. So Joseph weeps out loud, and it's so loud that the household of Pharaoh hears it. Um, this was a, a, a very uh, powerful emotion that came over Joseph. And he says to his brothers, I am Joseph. And he asked them, is my father still alive? Here is the one thing that is uppermost in his heart, his father's well-being. And he says, is my father still alive? And so he presents himself to his brothers. He's still at a distance from them. He identifies himself as Joseph and his commitment to his father. He has memories of his father and he you know, who knows, for years after he had been betrayed and sold into slavery and worked uh, in a prison as well, Joseph must have wondered about his father who loved him, who honored him and protected him, and wondered about his father's well-being in the midst of these violent brothers of his. Was his father still alive? Is he okay? That was uppermost in his heart. Uh, that reminds us of the... Uh, wonderful relationships that God places us in within our families and how uh, we should view our parents or our children with such love and regard that they are uppermost in our hearts, especially when we've been separated from them for some time. Uh, the brothers are shocked and they can't answer him. They're, I think, stunned by this claim that he's Joseph and they probably are skeptical of that and want to know is this another trick? What is Joseph doing here? Or what is this Egyptian doing here? Um, and so Joseph says to his brothers probably seeing their dismay and shock and uh, uh, feeling of being puzzled uh, Joseph says come near to me please. You know, come and look at me. Approach me. Stand next to me. See the family features in my face. Look at my eyes, my mouth, my face, my body. You can see that I am Joseph. I've grown, matured, aged, but I'm still that young man that you saw years ago. I'm Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, 
he identifies himself as his brother, invites them to come and, and see him firsthand, up close, and then reminds them of a unique part of history that they have not expressed. It's kind of the secret between them, which helps to identify the fact that he is in, in truth their brother Joseph. I'm the one you sold into slavery in Egypt. And so this little bit of information locks in to them the fact that this is indeed Joseph because only Joseph would have known that. Their father Jacob really doesn't know it yet. Benjamin, their brother, doesn't really know this yet. Joseph knew it and revealed that to them. That one little bit of information that they wanted to hide and they kept hidden as best they could for years and years. Joseph knew it. He didn't forget it. And he points this out to them. Now, uh, it, it, it's a reminder of the fact that when we are uh, 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 in a situation where someone has offended us deeply and there is uh, a need for reconciliation, uh, the, the past has to be dealt with and there has to be an accurate representation of what has taken place. Uh, not given over to hysterics and dramatics, not overstated, just a, a, a straightforward description of what has happened. This is what has happened in the past, and we've got to deal with it. But notice the gracious way in which Joseph deals with this. He doesn't beat them over the head with it. He's already seen the, uh, the transformation that has occurred in the lives of his brothers. He's already seen their repentance, their change of heart and mind, and the way their lives has, ha have changed. And so, rather than beating them over the head with uh, their wicked acts long ago, he explains how he has come to deal with it. How he has come to understand what has happened in their relationship with each other. And he puts it in a theological context, which is really rather shocking, and probably one which you would not anticipate here. Uh, he says to them, you're... I'm the one you sold into Egypt, and now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Okay, He's dealing with their emotions and dealing with how they are interpreting what he's saying here. And he doesn't want them to view this as a threat to them as he explains his identity. But he wants to help them see what he knows here, which is something a little bit more than they're prepared to recognize. He says... For God sent me before you to preserve life. God sent me before you to preserve life. Can you look back on the disappointments, frustrations, offenses that you've experienced in life? And while seeing indeed the, the wickedness that has occurred and all of its ramifications yet can also at the same time see how God superintended these events for your good. Indeed, for the good of others, too. Uh, this is a maturity that probably is beyond many of us, most of us, maybe all of us, to see God's hand at work in the various problems of life, the offenses of life that have made life horrible for us in different ways. Can you think back on times in your life when somebody has said something, has done something that has hurt you and harmed you deeply? How have you processed that in your heart and your mind? How have you dealt with that? Well, you be can become incredibly bitter and vengeful and look for an opportunity to strike back in some way if possible, but that was not Joseph's approach here. Now, granted, he saw these men as those who had repented. Things would have been different if these were the same murderous, vengeful, hostile men that he knew long ago. But things had changed. God had worked a work of grace in their hearts. And so that called for a different kind of response. If they were still unrepentant, if they were still hostile, violent men, then I think 
Joseph could have made use of other means to address them. But he here says, God sent me before you to preserve life. What an amazing thing. Uh, God is sovereign in even the uh, affairs of life, the uh, sins of life, and is able to turn them to our good, to our benefit. I'm sure for many of you at this moment, you are reminded of what Paul said in Romans chapter 8, where he says that all things work together for the good of those who are called by God. All things, not just the good things in life that happen, but also the bad things, the painful things, the, the, the sorrowful things, they also work in God's sovereign, sovereignty for our good. You know, it, you have here this amazing uh, juxtaposition between the evil actions of Joseph's brothers and the sovereign good purposes of God working concurrently in a way which is mysterious to us, in such a way that the brothers were guilty and responsible for their sinful actions. And yet God was working through those sinful actions to accomplish his own good purposes. And yet in such a way that God himself was not himself guilty for the sinful actions of Joseph's brothers. You see here, you have these two things taking place at the same time. God ordaining and decreeing the course of history. Arranging history such that the brothers sell Joseph into slavery to Egypt and that there would come a time when a great famine would come across the land. Joseph would be elevated in Egypt and God would provide for Joseph's family, the elect of God, to come to Egypt and find rescue and salvation through Joseph, whom they had betrayed long ago. And God works this out, if you will, on two tracks. On his sovereign plan on the one hand, and on the uh, affairs of men on the other. And when you look at history and time, we see God's sovereignty at work in the course of events, and also the responsibility of man for his actions. And we see that God works all these things out according to his sovereign will. And of course, the grand uh, example of that is in the crucifixion of Jesus, which uh, the Apostle Peter reminds us of in, uh, at Pentecost. They're in Jerusalem. They're in Jerusalem when he is confronting the very people who uh, may have uh, joined in the cries of crucify him, crucify him. Peter uh, preaches to them and explains the outpouring of the Spirit on the disciples there. And then he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. That's just like Joseph saying, uh, God sent me ahead of you for your good. This Jesus delivered up, according to the plan of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. <laughs> Jesus is not letting the audience go. He's not saying because you didn't physically, personally hang Jesus on the cross, you're, you're okay. No, you were cheering them on. You were supporting those who did that, and so therefore you also are guilty of this. You crucified him. You crucified this innocent man, but God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it, and so forth. And so Peter reminds us that God worked through the, the most evil act in all of human history. When men crucified the eternal Son of God, Jesus Christ, innocent entirely of any sin whatsoever, who only did good, they put him on a cross and condemned him as a criminal. Through this wickedness, God accomplished his great purpose. God sent his son ahead of us to save many lives, to save the elect of God, to save the brothers of Joseph, to save Joseph, to save Jacob to save all those who are elect in Christ, who are members of the family of God, 
We have God now as their Father through Christ's death on the cross. And so we have in Jesus this one who, like Joseph, revealed himself to his disciples. You remember when they uh, uh, were, when two of the disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus after, on the first day of the week, Jesus appears to them and he appears to them in the uh, meal that they serve and suddenly he disappears. And then he meets with the disciples in the upper room and there I have to think that there was a tremendous amount of shock involved. In fact, in Luke's gospel you can read about that in uh, I believe Luke chapter 24 where Luke talks about how Jesus appeared in the room where they had the doors locked and they knew that Jesus had been crucified, dead, and buried. And then suddenly there before him was Jesus standing uh, saying, uh, peace be to you. Uh, and, and so they were quite troubled by what they had seen. Um, and then what, what happens here? Uh, Luke 24, verse 41, While they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled f fish, and so forth. And Jesus also earlier said, uh, why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And so just as Joseph invited his brothers to come closer to him and to see him and to see his eyes, see his mouth, uh, see his resemblance to Benjamin, their brother, and to know that indeed he bears the family image of Jacob, their father, so Jesus reveals himself to his disciples and says, look at my hands, look at my side, my feet, touch me, feel my flesh, my bones, it's me. The self-disclosure of Jesus to his disciples. What a marvelous thing. Paul talks about how God reveals himself in Jesus in the gospel itself. We were not present at the, in that upper room. We did not have the dismay, the wonder, the amazement of seeing the glorious risen Jesus, but he reveals himself to us in his word as that word is preached. There's wonderful language which Paul uses here where he speaks of uh, the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ being revealed. And I have to think that Paul was thinking of that moment on the road to Damascus when Jesus confronted him, when a great light shone in front of uh, Paul uh, saw at the time and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, "Why? who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It's just like Joseph meeting with his brothers, confronting them, pointing out their sin, but then graciously dealing with them. Now, we don't have time to go into everything from here, so we'll, we'll begin to finish up here. Uh, but Joseph will provide for his brothers and provide for his father and allow them to come back to Egypt. And he tells the brothers to explain to their father all of the glory that uh, Joseph has there in Egypt. And should we not also likewise should we not also likewise tell others of the glory of Jesus who is in heaven now and who has marvelously displayed himself in the gospel of Christ and self-disclosed himself in these wonderful ways. If you've seen me, Jesus says, you've seen the Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for this revelation of yourself through Jesus Christ. And we do pray that as we meditate on these things, that your spirit would bless them to our hearts and equip us then to proclaim the glory of Christ and the wonder of his being in the image of the Father. Uh, we pray for your blessing on us in Jesus' name. Amen.